Hello students, welcome, for, welcome to our panel today. We're so excited to have you join us. Um, my name is Karina Sarah. I'll be handling questions in your chat if you have them, um, but very excited to just pass this off to Trent Walters and Teresa Kushner, who will be handling conversation today with our great panel, who will introduce themselves in just a bit. So I'm handing it off. Thank you very much, uh, Karina. We really appreciate you putting this together for us. And I'm sure that Trent thinks the same thing. So I'm gonna hand it off to him to get started on how we can introduce our panelists and then all the great questions that you guys are gonna have for this. This is the first in our series, by the way, of education and mentoring for uh, the students at Mayborn by discipline area. So we're excited that you're taking advantage of this. Great. Yeah, we're, we're excited. And, and this is all a part of our, our efforts to um, do, a, do what we can as a board to make sure that we're connecting the students back with the, the actual industry and getting you guys plugged in um, to folks that are actually doing the things that um, you're being taught um, at, the, at the journalism school. So, um, so we're really excited to have our, our panelists with us today. And apologize. I am missing, hold on just one second. Teresa, do you have, I'm sorry, I, I don't have the bios on the panelists, I'm, I apologize. Do you have those? You're on mute, I'm sorry. You're on mute, Teresa. Why don't we have the panelists introduce themselves and then they can, by, intro by introduction, you'll know exactly who's supposed to be part of this discussion. Perfect. Let's guys with the photojournalism, the ones that are taking pictures of us as we do this. <laughs> right. And let's start with, let's start with Thomas, Thomas Wang. Hey, thanks, Trent. Thanks, Teresa. Um, I'm Tom Wang. I'm an assistant managing editor at the Dallas Morning News been a journalist for 32 years now. Um, I've met some of you in other sessions. So um, one reason why I love my job is it, it changes quite a bit and I get to do a whole bunch of different things. So that keeps me um, learning and excited. Um, so I oversee um, Sunday page one of the Dallas Morning News. I edit enterprise stories. I do a lot of training and talent development. And then I've started a recent initiative that we call um, community funded journalism, which is raising um, foundation and philanthropic funding to support our most important public service topics. So we recently launched our education lab, which is a much larger education reporting team based on um, foundation support. And uh, one thing I want to really encourage you all to do is to show us your faces, because this is like an mm -hmm. opportunity for us to meet you and put faces to names and, and get to know you. So whenever you're in a session like this, please take advantage of that. Great. Thank you, Tom. Appreciate that. Good so advice. Glad you said that, Tom, because I was <laughs> wondering, too, about all those faces that we can't see. Okay, next, uh, Elvia, did I say your name right? Yes, perfect. Perfect. <laughs> um, I'm Elvia Limon and I am the engagement producer at the Texas Tribune. Um, and before um, I was at the Tribune, I was actually at the Dallas Morning News. So I know Tom from the DMN. Um, I write the newsletters here at the Trib. Um, I write the, our daily newsletter, which is The Brief. It has about 40K subscribers. Um, our coronavirus newsletter, which has another 40, 40K. And um, our Brief Weekly, which is our weekly version of The Brief um, that is sent every Saturday. Um, and um, our North Texas Brief, which is the North Texas edition of The Brief. Basically, I write a lot about um, politics, Texas politics um, policy. Um, I also help with our social media. I um, also organize uh, different things that uh, bring engagement. So um, our Facebook group, for example, has an AMA today, Ask Me Anything. 
uh, with one of our reporters. So our uh, Facebook group members are going to ask our reporters um, what's going on in the legislature uh, when it comes to the winter storm and what's being done to winterize these um, things that were not prepared for the storm. Um, and I also uh, host a biweekly uh, Instagram live series. So I do a lot of uh, digital stuff at the Trib. Awesome, awesome, great. Uh, and then Emily, last but not least, we'll have you introduce yourself. Um, hi, I'm um, Emily Goldstein. Um, my cat will also be attending this session. Um, <laughs> So um, I am a copy editor at the Texas Tribune. Um, so I'm um, a member of the management team and I, I am in charge of the copy desk. Um, and that involves, you know, copy editing stories, making sure our language is accurate and consistent, um, kind of doing like sensitivity reading um, to make sure that we're describing people um, accurately in the way they want to be described in a way that's like comfortable for our sources and our readers. Um, I also um, control our um, style guide at the Tribune. So, um, you know, whenever we need to add new entries, um, like I've written a lot about vaccines this year that I never thought I would learn. Um, I also um, got my master's from UNT, uh, as did Elvia. Um, in uh, 2017, um, and I've worked at the Dallas Observer and the Dallas Morning News, so I'm very familiar with that area as well. Nice, very nice. Well, thank you all for taking time out of your afternoon to meet with us and join this panel and, and answer questions. Um, Teresa, I'll start if, if that's okay, and we'll just start getting into questions. Great, all right. So. Um, Tom, let's start with you. What's what was your first job after graduation, and and what did it teach you? And then we might even go into a little bit of since you're kind of the the, the veteran of the group, um, even how it's sort of changed over the years. If you you know you're thirty plus years in, it's probably changed a lot from those first days. Let us know about some of that. Yeah, it's a good question. So. Um... I want to preface it by saying uh, I had I, I had a kind of strange background in that I wasn't like uh, I didn't have a linear path. I, I wasn't a journalism student, so I was actually uh, my degrees are in computer science. Um, I grew up believing that I was going to become a scientist and be in academia because that's what a lot of my family was about. But I always was a writer. I had it in my DNA. I loved it. Um, like many of you do, and I just didn't really listen to that closely enough. So, so I studied computer science in college, but also joined the college paper, like many of you have, and just accidentally fell head over heels in love with journalism. It really brought me closer to the world, got me out of away from my desk and and into into the field. And so, when I graduated. Um, I was lucky enough to get a bunch of newspaper internships based on my clips from college. So I was in Cleveland, Roanoke, Virginia, Greensboro, North Carolina, and Norfolk, Virginia. And so my first permanent job that went beyond the internship was at the Virginian Pilot in Norfolk. And what I learned there was that it's just, in your first job, it's just so important to focus on the fundamentals of the craft, just really throw yourself into learning everything you can um, in whatever uh, field you're at, whether it's photojournalism or audience journalism, um, reporting, writing, just really focus on that. Um, and in order to do that, you have to really find good mentors. Don't allow yourself to drift and not have anyone looking out for your interests. So sometimes you have to initiate that and be assertive and find, you know, th those people are in whatever newsroom or organization you're at. Sometimes it's a little harder to find them, but it's up to you to do that. And then finally, I learned that relationships are just so important. It's not just the work, but it's all the great people like Elvia and Emily that you meet along the way. So make the effort to build those relationships. Great, great. Um, Elvia, Emily, you guys are 
more recent grads. I'm sure your your path, um, we'd love to hear about that as well. Elvia, why don't you go? And then Emily, you can go after her. Sure. Um, so when I first graduated from undergrad, I went to UNT for both grad and undergrad. Um, I got a job in um, SEO writing um, and content writing. So I was not in journalism from the beginning. And um, I absolutely hated that job. <laughs> Um, but it was a learning experience because I got to write um, content for um, these big uh, personal injury lawyers and basically like write their website and I got to learn what SEO was. Um, but after I decided I didn't want to do that, I went back to school. Um, and during my grad work, I got a breaking news internship with the DMN. And I had other internships before that too. Um, I thought I wanted to be a magazine writer and then I got a magazine internship and I hated that. Um, and then I, I didn't think I wanted to be uh, in newspaper writing, um, but then I got a breaking news internship and I absolutely loved it. I fell in love with it. And I just kind of stayed uh, at the DMN. Um, I got an internship with Aldea, which is the Spanish language um, sister publication for the DMN. <laughs> And I just kind of stayed there and I got hired. Um, so my first journalism job was actually a community reporter. Um, I um, was a reporter for like five suburbs and I covered the school districts, uh, city hall, what was happening um, in the police department, whatever it was. Um, so that was my first journalism job, but my first actual job was not um, in journalism, but now it's so applicable because I have to think about C SEO um, in my current job because you want people to actually read the content that you're uh, publishing. Um, so uh, even if you start out in a job that isn't in journalism, there's something that you probably can learn um, that you can apply in the journalism field. Yeah, and before Emily jumps in, I think underscoring some of what you just said about your journey and particularly the, the internships that you got along the way, the multiple things that you tried that you thought you really liked, and then when you got in there to actually do it, you hated it. So the importance, and I know that you know the, the, the folks at the journalism school are, are encouraging this, but what, em, what Elvia just said, um, underscores the importance of internships and getting out there and trying some stuff, the stuff, particularly the thing you think you want to do, you may get in there and it's like, oh my gosh, I can't stand this and trying different things before you graduate. So you can kind of hit the ground running there. Um, Emily, real quick, your story, and then we'll start asking different questions of different people. Um, sure. Um, my first job was at the Dallas Morning News um, uh, as an assistant editor for a group of community newspapers that no longer <laughs> exist. Um, I guess one of the things that's really good about, I mean, even though I was with a bigger publication, like the, the newspapers I was working for were really small. And one of the benefits of that, I think, is that you get to try out a lot of different roles. Um, so, you know, when I, when I was in college, I didn't really know that copy editing was a thing. Um, it's not something that I really did in any of my classes. I thought I was gonna be a reporter, um, but, um, you know, copy editing just turned out to be something I was really good at. And um, eventually like that's, you know, where that first job led me toward. Great, great. Well, that's a fantastic story, Emily, because yesterday I just told someone that journalists always appreciate a very good editor. You know, so if you're a very good editor, I congratulate you on that. That's a hard thing to be. Um, I want to ask you guys a question, and for some of you, it might be a little bit more difficult to think through it, but for Emily, it's going to be really easy. Uh, and so we'll start with you. What advice would you give your 21 year old self just step starting out on their career that you would have hoped somebody had given you at that point in time? Um, I thought about this a lot. Um, I think I would tell myself that this path is not going to go the way you thought it would, but that's okay. Um, I, I worked for seven years at the morning news. I, 
quit journalism and took a job in marketing because I, I wanted to make more money. I wanted better hours. Uh, like Elvia said, I hated that job. And that's how I wound up back at school at UNT. Um, then I got a job that paid a lot less than the job I had before grad school. Then I moved to Austin. I thought I was going to get a PhD. But while I was doing that, I got um, a fellowship at the Texas Tribune. And I loved it. And I decided that's where I want to be. So um, I, I feel like the past couple of years like, are the first time in my career that I've really um, enjoyed my job and the place I work and I just it feels right to me and it took a long time to get here but like every step along the way was important. Um, such good advice. And how about you Elvia? Um, well definitely going back on the internship thing uh, I would have looked out for more internships even after graduation because sometimes you feel like you have to do them within the time frame that you're doing your degree, but some internships will accept you even a year after your degree. Um, again, I, I would uh, go off what Emily said. Um, it's not going to be this traditional, um, I'm going to get a newspaper job type of thing. You might, but um, you might not. You know, I'm in a field right now, an engagement, which is very different from the traditional like newspaper reporter role. And I think sometimes students forget that there's more in journalism than reporting. I mean, if you want to do um, events, you can be in journalism. If you want to do audience work and work in social media, you can be in journalism. If you want to do PR, you can be in journalism because we have a PR person who um, does all our media inquiries. Um, if you want to be in marketing, you can be in journalism. So it, there's more paths in journalism than just reporting. Um, even within the newsroom, um, you can be an editor, a copy editor, um, you can be a photographer, um, a photo editor, a page designer, or engineering. We have an engineering team that um, does our website. So just reminding myself that I don't have to limit myself or put myself in a box um, from the start. Um, I can explore all these other options. That's great advice. How about you, Tom? Yeah, I really love what Emily and Elvia are saying uh, about nonlinear paths and knowing that it's not going to be what you expect and also not putting yourself in a box. So, you know, I, I made my decision to, um, I took a leap of faith to become a journalist when I was 22, 23, because I had gone to grad school as well. And I would tell my younger self that um, it's this is in, this is brave. Um, it's okay to be scared because I was scared. Um, but there are a lot of people out there who are going to be on your path, who are going to be looking out for you, and it's not going to be easy at all. And also tell him that um, this is really your chance to figure out if you truly love. Uh, this work and if it's your life's mission because really you should I guess I would say you should only do journalism if it's your life's mission there are plenty of, of other great fields uh, to work in um, that may not be as uh, chaotic and stressful as journalism can be um, and then I'd also tell them that um, even as you're throwing yourself into the work. Uh, don't forget to have a life as best as you can and always keep your family first, no matter what. Because I think sometimes I, as a younger journalist, um, forgot that. And uh, I wish I had done a better job at, um, uh, you know, taking care of my family. That's great advice for any job, Tom. Thank you very much. Trent, do you have a question you'd like to ask the panel? Yep, yep. Um, we got a, <laughs> several, so we're going to eventually turn it over to y'all to ask questions. But um, so if you guys were looking for uh, your replacement uh, to hire somebody to replace you in what you do, what sort of experience would you want to see on their resume? And thinking about it in terms of what sort of schooling sort of experience and then what sort of life experience would you want to see um, from some folks? And I'll just, whoever 
feels like they have a really good answer, jump in. <laughs> I can go first. Um, uh, so I would like to have someone who's done news writing, um, even though I work in newsletters, um, a lot of it is the basics, you know, like um, having a lead and having your nut graph, even if it is within two paragraphs. Um, and also some social media experience, of course, um, because if you can write for um, social media, you can write for a newsletter. Um, and, and the rest you can kind of learn on your own. Um, so I would want to do that. And also, of course, like I look for someone who has some kind of um, background and engagement, whether it's um, having ideas where you ask readers, you know, what they think about a topic and then write a story off of that, um, or you go out into the community and engage with them. Uh, by having an event or uh, it's there's so many different um, aspects to engagement uh, journalism so that's that's what I would look for um, but definitely definitely having a strong just a writing background is essential I think for anything that and a strong social media uh, background um, it's not easy to write for online and it's not easy to write in general um, so that and I think we I will say that like when people are looking at your writing they will notice the typos and they will notice um the things that don't make any sense um because you're one of so many people who are applying to these jobs so like just someone who's a very careful writer that's that's who I would look for um I recently participated in the hiring process for the first time so uh I would like to second Elvia's point. Um, when you're writing a cover letter, uh, make sure you spell the hiring manager's name right. Make sure you are applying to the correct organization. Um, <laughs> those are things that can pretty quickly get you knocked out. Um, and it, I, I saw that not just from young journalists, but from very experienced journalists who just didn't have somebody else look at their, their letter, I think. So anyways. Um, I, I guess um, in terms of like experience or, you know, skills that I want to see on someone's resume, I, I try to be kind of open about that because, you know, I acknowledge like my path to this role was not what I expected it to be. And so I try to recognize that in others. Um, you know, obviously for a copy editor, you know, somebody needs to have, you know, a lot of knowledge about the AP style book. Um, we do um, a copy editing test um, that involves, you know, questions about Texas government since that's what we focus on, but also, you know, can somebody spot these style errors? Um, so that's really important. Um, and the other thing I think is, is not necessarily something you can gauge from a resume. It's more something you get from a cover letter and an interview. And that is just like somebody's passion for the role. And, and it just, it really shows if you've done your research on an organization um, and, and, you know, this, this position that I, I helped hire for, we wound up choosing the less experienced journalists because that person just was really passionate and had a, an excellent attitude. Um, and, you know, when, when we ask, you know, why do you want to work here? It was just like a great answer, so. I want to reinforce what Emily and LD are saying about the importance of writing. And I, I want to encourage all of you to really lean into uh, the craft of writing and being the best that you can be, knowing that everybody has a journey as a writer. Everyone's continuing to improve on it. The reason I say it is because um, whatever field you choose, whether it's journalism or law or medicine or business, the ability to write and to be able to explain things and tell compelling stories will set you apart from so many other people in those fields. Um, you know, I can tell you over the last 30 years, um, from my experience, you just aren't a lot of good writers. There, there are smart people, but just 
they cannot write or have a sense of stories. So if you have that, and I suspect that you do, that is how you set yourself apart from, from others. Um, I'd also say in terms of um, looking at my replacement, I think um, both in terms of work and life experience, resilience is just so important uh, because, uh, you know, specifically in local news, it's just such a hard um, changing environment right now. So the best people are, are folks who are adaptable and versatile and, and have already experienced hardships in their lives. And they show, they show us how they get through it. Um, and then finally, I would say, um, I would try to find someone who is not like me, who does not necessarily look like me. I think too many times senior people um, uh, in high positions look to hire people who remind them of themselves. And we really need um, a much more diverse workplace. And to do that, we have to step outside of who we are and find the people who who will lead, you know, who will be in the next generation who may not be exactly like who, who we are. I have one more question before we open it up to, to everyone else. Um, what does the future of your industry look like? And what advice would you give uh, these students to prepare for the future of your industry? I know that one wasn't on your list. I could start. I mean, I, I guess I'd say because um, the future is uncertain and unclear, uh, you have to be someone who wants to constantly learn. Um, this is the kind of work where uh, you can do, uh, you know, I think, um, well, both Emily and Elvia have mentioned, you can do many different things along the way, even within journalism. And journalism is changing so quickly. Uh, the kind of work um, that Emily and Elvia do now may not quite have been around 30 years ago. So, you know, we could not have predicted um, the digital disruption, the importance of newsletters, the importance of social and building audience. We could not have, well, I'm sure some smart people did predict the idea of the multi two way conversations, the idea that our audience can help us figure out what we should cover. Um, but there wasn't really that 30 years ago. So, so I'd encourage you to be the person who knows that the future is uncertain, who can be relatively comfortable with that and know that you're going to have the mindset of constantly learning new things to adapt. Um, yeah, I would Second that, I mean, I, I graduated um, from Mizzou, my undergrad in 2007, and just the amount that the industry has changed since then has been uh, wild and it's been hard to deal with. Um, I think um, the future, you're probably gonna see more nonprofit news organizations. Um, I think traditional business models might not um, hold up, um, though there's a lot of argument over that and, and uh, you know, a lot of organizations are adapting. Um, and I think, you know, one of the most important things for somebody who's entering the industry is, is to be flexible. Um, you know, the first job you get is not going to be your job forever. And um, you know, in, in an economy like we're in, um, it's, it's hard to find jobs right now. And, um, you know, I think, I'm trying to think where I'm going with this, <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I think you want, you want to take a job in journalism that you can find um, with the knowledge that, you know, that's going to lead you towards something um, you know, that may be more what you're looking for. Um, the other advice I try to give people, which sounds a little bit opposite to what I just said, is, is that you want to, you know, when, when you're first looking for jobs, you're like grateful for anyone who will hire you. Um, 
and I mean, even later in your career you are, but you also want to be careful about, you know, the organizations that you're going to and, you know, gauge, sorry, if you can, you know, does this feel like a healthy workplace? Um, you know, how, how, you know, what, what do I know about people who work here now? Some of this you can learn, you know, from internships. Um, I, I think there's still a lot, um, as I'm sure y'all have seen on Twitter lately, a lot of argument about, you know, what young journalists should have to go through. Um, and, and I think there's still some unhealthy attitudes out there. So, um, you know, just it's not unreasonable to want a healthy workplace. So keep that in mind when you're looking as well. Yeah. It's also not unreasonable to have a paid internship, but um, I, yeah, I second that. I don't know what the future holds, uh, but I will say that from the time I started college in 2010 and now, um, so many things have changed. I remember uh, one of my classes, we kind of learned social media and we're like, I remember it was like, you might have to tweet. And um, yeah, I definitely have to do that now. Um, and I remember getting on Twitter. Um, I got a Twitter account in 2009 when I was in high school and I didn't touch it until like 2013. Um, so just being flexible and knowing that things might change and being okay with um, changing along with the industry um yeah you you might not start out with uh something that you like but eventually you you will find it um if you stick with it and yeah i i like my my job wasn't a thing before i got it i was the first engagement producer at the tribune um and i was the first engagement reporter at the dallas morning news so um you never know, you might, if you stick with it, you might be able to create your own role too within the journalism industry um, because it's changing so much. Um, I think that's, yeah, I don't know what, I also think it might be more nonprofit, but of course I have gone to the nonprofit side now. So that's why I'm like, so it's such a big believer in it now, but we'll see, we'll see what, what it looks like in the future. Thank you guys very much. That was very thoughtful. I took, I took notes. I mean, it's, those are great things to be able to tell people. Um, are there any other questions from the, the people on the, the Zoom meeting from the students themselves? Do you have questions of the panelists? You know, unmute yourself and by all means ask. Um, I have a question. So as a journalist, how do you guys separate um, objectivity from sympathy and um, empathy while reporting on um, your subject or a subject? That's a great question. And Mackenzie, can you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, of course. Um, my name is Mackenzie Bryce. I am a freshman at the University of North Texas. Um, I am a currently digital and broadcast journalism major, but I am um, going to switch to digital and print. Um, and I'm from Waxahachie, which is about 30 minutes south of Dallas. And I've grown up um, reading the Dallas Morning News and most recently reading the Texas Tribune. Mm -hmm. All right, Paul, thank you so much for your readership and support. I'm sure the Tribune and the news appreciate it. So I would say, and there are many journalists who would disagree with me. Um, and I think it's, it's fine to kind of work through it. Um, I don't, I'm not one who believes that there is a, a, a true objectivity. Um, I think that everybody has their own um, experience and, and um, the way that they look at things, depending on where and how they grew up and in what circumstances. And the whole reason why we want to um, build a diverse newsroom staff is to try to have all of those different perspectives that will help us find stories and make better decisions. So the idea that we bring diverse journalists in, but then decide that there's some standard of objectivity, that doesn't really make sense to me. I think what does make sense to me is um, fairness and accuracy and professional standards that 
you know, whatever reporting we produce, um, you know that we've done everything we can to um, do it with integrity, with transparency, with um, as, as completely and fairly as we can. Um, but that's not the same thing as objectivity. Um, you know, some people say that objectivity is really this thing that's created by the people who are uh, the dominant people in power. Um, so whose objectivity are, are we really talking about? So I, I would adhere more toward um, the idea that as profession, as professional journalists, we have certain standards that we want to uphold. Um, yeah, I agree with Tom on this one. Um, I think the people who will argue that there is a true objectivity tend to be older journalists um, who just ascribe to more of an old fashioned definition. Um, and I think they also tend to be white men um, because as Tom said, that's been the dominant group and especially the dominant group in journalism. Um, I think that things that somebody might say make you not objective actually make you a better person to cover certain stories. Um, you know, for example, when I was in grad school, I did um, a lot of research on mental health in journalism um, and how we cover that. And it's something I have a lot of personal and family experience with. And, you know, I really feel like that made my research different, that made the questions I asked different. And, and that's, you know, the same thing for a journalist. Um, you know, I also saw, and, and maybe you saw this too, a tweet lately about, you know, this journalist who, you know, they were interviewing somebody who'd experienced trauma and they thought that being objective meant that they couldn't react to that person's responses. Um, and I think, you know, especially in a time like we're in now where there's so much trauma and, um, you know, a lot of our stories are about people who've experienced, you know, death or natural disasters and things like that. Um, you know, being objective doesn't mean not being human. And um, we have a responsibility to our sources to be able to, to ask questions and to cover their stories um, in, a, in a very human way. And, um, you know, I, I think, I, I think, um, you know, traditional notions of objectivity don't necessarily um, help with that. I, I agree. I mean, I've had some of the best interviews that I've had were with people who are just, um, just people who I could relate to. And they were able to open up to me um, because they felt comfortable. Um, I've cried with sources before when I've covered trauma um, and we've talked about it, you know, and I feel like that you can tell that in your writing too, whenever you have a really good interview like that. Um, and, and I agree with the objectivity of like, who, whose objectivity video are we talking about here? You know, my experience um, as a woman and my experience as a Latina is very different from maybe my editor who is not. Uh, who might be white, older, male. Um, so you, it's just a different background. It's different. I have a different reality. I have a different experience. And that's the same thing with our sources. Um, but it doesn't mean like, for example, if the governor says something and blames someone that we're not going to talk to that person who he's talking about, you know, and ask them like, hey, the governor said this about you. What, what is your response? Um, and that's the fairness part of it. Um, and making sure that you are covering everything that is being said. So if someone makes a claim that you actually fact check that claim and make sure that you just don't put it out there without making sure that it's an actual fact. Um, uh, that, that's the difference between objectivity and fairness, I think, and, and just being factual. I'd be interested in knowing from all of you um, kind of what you're thinking about in terms of your career paths and what you're worried about. What, what are you concerned about? Uh, 
Um, if I may, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, hello, my name is Sade. I am a graduate student at the University of North Texas. Um, I don't have necessarily like a specific path, but so one thing that I've been thinking about lately a whole lot is, um, Emily, I think you all mentioned, um, or was it Elvia? I don't remember, sorry. Um, but you're talking about just, oh, wanting, or being healthy in a work, like in your work, in your newsroom, basically. So I kind of, that's a bit about where I am. I've been having like conversations about objectivity and everything for ever <laughs> since I started uh, thinking about journalism. And um, just during, especially during the pandemic and I got like my first newsroom job, I've just been thinking about like, how do you, protect yourself in certain situations um I, I don't know how to basically I guess my question is how do I'm sorry let me think about this real quick one thing I, I wanted to ask about is like you know of course imposter syndrome does it has anyone uh dealt with that and then how do you basically defend yourself and others um in a respectful way in your newsroom, especially when you are um, the most inexperienced and especially if you are, you know, one of you, um, women, people of color, whatever in your newsroom. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, that's a really hard question to answer because it's so dependent on your supervisor and the type of newsroom you're in and, and what that structure is like. Um, one thing I would say is being the most inexperienced person in terms of journalism is not necessarily a bad thing. You know, part of the reason we hire young people is to get new ideas and new perspectives. Um, and it doesn't invalidate your opinions, um, you know, just because you're younger or less experienced than someone else. Um, I think it's a really hard path to navigate because um, I've worked for terrible bosses and I've worked in places that did not feel healthy. Um, and, you know, it's, I, I can remember, you know, when I was younger talking to my parents about this and, and their attitude that I think reflects their generation is like, it's a job, you're not gonna love it. And, you know, you go to work and you do your job and, you know, you, you do that until you can find something else. And that's never really settled well with me. And I, I don't, they sound like horrible people. They're not, they're lovely people. <laughs> but um, it's just like a different, a totally different attitude. And I even, um, even among people like who are my age who work different types of jobs, I feel like journalists have a different we all feel emotionally connected to this. And in some ways uh, we feel like being a journalist is our identity, which is not always healthy, but um, you know, I, I think, you know, you want to find somebody that you work with who will be a support for you, whether, you know, hopefully that's a supervisor. Um, so hopefully you have a supervisor who has your back. Um, but if not, you know, there are other allies that you can have, you know, I, um, Tom mentioned earlier the importance of having mentors. Um, there's a woman I work with who was like officially my mentor when I was a fellow. She's only a few years older than me. Um, and especially like during the pandemic, you know, we vent to each other like every day and check in with each other on text, you know, via text and um, Slack and, um, you know, I guess um, I'm trying to think of this from the perspective of somebody who is working in a place where that they don't feel as healthy. And I think um, you need to remember that it's okay to set boundaries, um, that, um, you know, you, a work-life balance is a normal thing to have. Um, and, you know, it, it's hard to do that when you're not being supported, um, but it doesn't mean it's the wrong thing to do. I hope that helps a little bit. I wanna, I wanna add to that. Um, like, I, I understand, like, I've been in situations where it's frustrating, where it's like, 
Um, this is um, not very like, that's a little racist or, you know, like things. That, and so you want to like bring things to an attention, uh, to someone's attention, or like, it's not very inclusive or, you know, whether it's a policy within the newsroom or how we're um, describing sources or, or the types of stories that we're not including or are including in our coverage. And the biggest, um, I guess, thing that I could say is make allies whenever, wherever you can, because um, those people um, that I made friends with within the newsroom, like we got together and we were able to like speak up about things within the newsroom. But then sometimes like you just need someone to vent to, you know? Um, and that's something that I have um, personally, I have so a lot of um, friends who I have group texts with who are in journalism. Um, I'm very proud of my group text. It's called Mean Girls instead of Mean Girls. Um, and so it's like all these women in audience who are a part of this um, group text that we kind of just like talk about our frustrations or talk about something funny that's online or we talk about ideas that we've had in our, we don't work in the same newsrooms, but we talk about like, hey, I'm really proud of this, or I'm really frustrated with this. I don't know what to do. And we kind of just talk about our things that are happening in the industry and things that are happening within our personal lives. And then things that are happening um, just online and during the pandemic. So having that support system is like super healthy and helpful, I think. Um, so if you can find someone within that newsroom who, um, you can relate to and you can talk to and open up to that's uh i think a way to create that healthy environment like having someone who has your back and it might take you going up to people and going to lunch with people and having coffee with people and trying to figure out who's going to be the person who might have your back in the newsroom um but also like reach out to people um in the industry uh, you can seriously like if you like someone's work or if you're reading someone's work you can probably email them and tell them who you are. I've had so many students reach out to me um, and ask me like, hey, I read the newsletter every day and I have some questions. And I've, I've been texting with some like UNT kids too. And um, usually people in the industry will be open. Um, and if they're not, then you didn't want to talk to them anyway. So um, finding allies that way within your newsroom and with that, within outside. And of course, like joining um, organizations. I'm part of NHJ. Um, you can go to um, different um, organizations or um, groups for journalists, uh, and that's a good way to finding mentors too, who uh, look like you and who have the same experience as you and who might have the same issues as you. Aldi, I'm glad you brought that up because um, I've been a member of AAJA for a long, long time, and it's had a, just an incredible influence on on my life and career and just all of the people that that I've met have made a huge difference for me. So sure day, I think that's one one thing that that you can do. Um, and I'm glad you brought this up because I think um, a lot of uh, local newsrooms, traditional newsrooms um, are really struggling um, with creating a healthy workplace because I think for a long time traditionally, newsrooms have not been the healthiest of places. And, uh, you know, you can read the New York Times diversity report and see that um, even in a place like the Times, uh, journalists of color and women journalists um, feel like they're not seen and not heard. And um, I've had that experience at the news and other places, and it's just something that some of us are working to try to change, um, but I suspect that that your generation is going to be the one that really changes that. Um, you know, the interesting dynamic in local newsrooms um, is that you have um, a couple of different generations. So you have the older journalists who came up um, uh, working a certain way, and then you have younger journalists, incredibly super talented, who have other other expectations and so that tension and that change is happening and I think in a in places like the Tribune um, well the Tribune's been around for 11 years I think but still there's that opportunity to have built that culture from the beginning 
Also, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I, I want to add that sometimes I will say that some of the older journalists have definitely taken me under their wing, um, especially um, older female journalists, just because they kind of, they, you know, they realize that, like, I would go up to them and be like, hey, I, I don't know what I'm doing, or I feel like I'm, I'm an imposter, or, you know, and that's another way of getting to your second part of the question of like getting around that imposter syndrome, because yeah, I have that. Um, I've had that for a while, like it'll sneak up and then you'll feel really confident. And then it comes back up and you're like, Oh God, do I know what I'm doing? And like, am I, do I suck? You know, um, am I, you know, like going to ever be like uh, in a high position or people are going to continue to hire me. And so everyone has that. And you just kind of really having those mentors really helps you kind of bring you back down. And, you know, I have so many friends who are like, you need to snap out of it. Like, you know what you're doing and, um, and they wouldn't have hired you because without them knowing that, you know, what you're doing too. So, um, that's another part of it. Like that helps you kind of get out of that, like imposter mentality, having someone who can tell you to like, snap out of it. Uh, Emily and I have a really good colleague, uh, Brandon, who will do that to us. Sometimes we'll sit us down and be like, you need to stop it. Like you need to know your worth and like know that you're here for a reason. So if you are in an internship, you are there for a reason. Um, and it's because people see value in, in who you are and in your work and in your experience. And everyone has that imposter syndrome. It, it happens, but just remind yourself that you are there for a reason. People see your worth when you're there. That's so great advice to all of you guys. Uh, we have one last question. But before I ask that one last question, I have a question for Emily. What's the cat's name? <laughs> Her name is Ellie. Uh, oh, good, good. Well, she was so part of this discussion. I thought we should know what her name was. I've learned it's best not to fight against it. She's just <laughs> It's great. I think it's hilarious how you said you need to set boundaries and then the cat just walked. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah well, yeah, she's definitely the one charge here. <laughs> very, very loving uh, cat. So here's the last question for the panel. Um, what's the one great piece of advice that you got when you were starting out that you remember and you'd like to share today? I had to think really hard about this one, um, but I, I think some of the best advice I've gotten is is what advice not to take. Um, you know, I, I think people who've been in the industry a long time will tell you, you know, oh my God, you can't get a job in marketing or advertising and ever come back. Um, they, there's, you know, people sometimes have the attitude that there's this specific path you have to follow. And um, I mean, I, I'm reiterating some of what I said earlier, but um, you know, as Elvia explained, there's so many different roles that are available um, in journalism now, and you know, things are so much more flexible than they used to be. Um, and so I, I think, you know, when you're considering like your first job or your next job, you know, I always used to think like, oh my God, where is this, what is this going to mean? And, and, you know, it, it means what you make it, you know, I, I hated my job in marketing, but they're still skills that I learned in that position that are useful for what I'm doing now. Um, and, and took me to the next step. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think you just, you know, you have to be careful. You're going to get a lot of advice. And, you know, it, some of it is, is good and some of it might not work for you and that's okay too. I got some really good advice from uh, when I was starting out from uh, a guy named Fred Kirsch who uh, was a really talented reporter and incredible writer at the Virginian Pilot. And he said that, um, you know, your career is gonna be a long one. And at the end of it, uh, you're not, you're actually not gonna remember all the stories uh, that you told or that you wrote, uh, but you will remember the people and the friendships that you made. So 
as you um, launch your careers, just keep that in mind. Remember that you're going to be meeting so many um, fascinating, super talented people, and you're going to want to make friendships. And those are the things that you'll remember. Mine is definitely like being flexible. Um, but I've also gotten a lot of advice and I can't remember like word by word, but um, just ha making that time to have that um, personal life, you know, like making sure that you have that work-life balance, even though it's really hard. Um, I can talk for, for example, my experience, I work a really odd job with odd hours. Like yesterday, um, I worked until like 10 p.m. So it's sometimes it's like really hard to carve that um, time in, but, um, just knowing that you can do it. Like I, like, for example, um, usually in the morning I'll do all like my personal things and I just kind of rearrange my schedule to work for my life. Um, and setting boundaries too. That's another uh, thing that I definitely have had to have mentors tell me, like, you need to send boundaries. You need to, um, you need, and also knowing your worth. Um, and that's a really hard, um, especially in journalism, because when you're young, you're willing to take any job, even if it pays you like 10 K a year or whatever, like, like horrible amount. Um, but know your worth, um, know that you have what you have is valuable and you can bring value to a news organization. And that's something that I feel like doesn't really you don't really talk about when you're a young reporter because sometimes there's this like mentality of like, you got to take this crap and from people or you have to take an unpaid internship or you have to take what people will give you. And that's not the case. Um, like you are worthy of getting um, a job that is worth what you are and, and you're worthy of getting a paid internship and you're worthy of like, having uh, benefits and you're worthy of having a work-life balance. So that's something that I think that's the advice that I definitely take to heart and I remember constantly. Great. Well, the time goes so fast. Oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, I wanna thank all of the, the panelists for, for joining us today. Uh, and all you students for, for being here, asking really, really great questions. Hopefully this was, was helpful. Um, Karina, is there anything else we need to do to, to close this out? No, we are so excited, like uh, Trent said, to have you all here. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you to our students. And students, keep in mind, there will be one of these every week between now and the first week of April. So we hope to have you join us um, another time throughout the semester. Uh, and those further details can be shared either in your school email or our social media. So we hope to see you at more of these. Thank you again to our panel. Thank you again to our board members and uh, have a great afternoon. Enjoy lunch. Bye guys. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Take care.